Maranatha. Maranatha. Even so, come, Lord. I think the early church teaches us that the hotter it gets on earth, the more your heart aches for heaven. There are other things that induce us to that. I, I find the, the longer I go, the older I get. My heart cries out, even so, come Lord, come Lord. Well, turn in your Bibles to Paul's letter we call 1 Corinthians. It's right after Romans in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians, as we begin today a study of what I'm calling the perfect gospel for an imperfect church, and I need to give credit where credit is due. Uh, we were, when I was bouncing this idea around a few months ago, talking to Linda Hare, we're going back and forth with ideas, and I think she actually came up with this, this theme, and I think it's, it's excellent. It nails it. It's the perfect gospel, because only one for an imperfect church, and there's a lot of those, and we're in that category. We're going to open the study up today, I'm giving some background and some context for you. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, as we, we just take the Paul's address here to the church of God that is in Corinth. I want you to stand with me, if you would, and follow along in your Bibles as I read uh, these verses and then introduce some of you or remind others of you about this place called Corinth and these people who made up the church of God there. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And my prayer is as we study through this that we will, we will at once both be uh, challenged, searching our hearts, or are, are we afflicted or prone towards some of the problems he addresses here? And also be encouraged that for all of the mess that was the church of God at Corinth, it was still identified by the apostle under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as the church of God at Corinth. Thank you. Please be seated. In the first century, Corinth was the, uh, the leading commercial center of southern Greece, uh, it was infamous for its immorality and paganism. Uh, but in spite of these great uh, obstacles, the Apostle Paul managed to plant a church, a Christian church there, on his second missionary journey. What we read a while ago in Acts 18, verses 1 to 17, is the, is the story of the planting of the church at Corinth. And this was as Paul was making his second journey. The church manifested some encouraging things. It was, it was growing, but it was plagued with problems. Moral problems, ethical problems, doctrinal problems, practical problems. They manifested themselves both in their corporate experience together as a congregation and in their private lives as well. So Paul writes this letter that we call 1 Corinthians. I say that because he'll make a reference here as we read through it to the letter I wrote you. There's another letter that went before this that, that did not, has not survived. But the letter we know is 1 Corinthians. He writes this uh, to address these things. First of all, to address some of the problems. And second, to answer questions that have been posed to him on some crucial issues by members of the congregation. This place, Corinth, was a, was a uh, bustling hub of worldwide commerce. 
it was a very uh, idolatrous place. Uh, had many opportunities to worship idols there. In fact, it was so, uh, became so notorious for the immorality that if you wanted to insult someone in that world, uh, you would call them a Corinthian. And if you wanted to really lay the ultimate insult on a woman, you would call her a Corinthian woman. This place, as we said, was in southern Greece. It was on an isthmus, and so it was, it was bounded uh, by the Aegean Sea and the Adriatic Sea. And it's kind of fascinating historically that Corinth reached out and touched both of those places. And if you've ever been down to, uh, to the Keys, Karen and I went down to the Florida Keys years ago and, and, and drove from southern Florida down into the Keys. And it's kind of fascinating to be able to walk on one side of Key West and stand in the Gulf and then go to the other side of Key West and stand in the Atlantic. That was just kind of an interesting thing for me. Well, that's something like Corinth was. They would actually, uh, some of the folks who traveled on ships, some of the smaller ships would actually take their ships over land at this point to get to the other sea rather than take about a 200-mile trip around uh, the peninsula to get there. Now, there was an attempt by Nero early on to build a canal, but an actual canal across that cut across the isthmus there was not built until 1893. In Corinth was this temple of Aphrodite. It sat upon a, what they called Acro Corinthus on a, on a, a peak, a very uh, conspicuous temple. Aphrodite was the goddess of love. There were 1,000 consecrated prostitutes who serviced the worshipers at the temple of Aphrodite. So you can get the idea of why if you wanted to insult a woman, you call her a Corinthian woman because you're basically saying she's like a temple prostitute. In Paul's day, the population of Corinth was about 700,000, two-thirds of the population being slaves. And as I said, in the face of that, of those challenges, God enabled him by the Spirit to plant a church there. What we read from Acts 18 and the surrounding passages, persecution in Macedonia drove him south to Athens, and from there he proceeded to, to Corinth. He was a tent maker, remember? That's what he did by trade, and he encountered Aquila and Priscilla, who also were tent makers, and they had been expelled from Rome. While at Corinth, Paul wrote 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. And as was pointed out, he ministered the Word of God and was there for 18 months. That's a significant amount of time for Paul to stay somewhere. After his departure, when we read other passages, we know that Apollos came through from Ephesus, and he ministered for a season in the Corinthian church. It was while he was in Ephesus <clears throat> during his third missionary journey that he received word. It was someone from the household of Chloe comes and gives him a report concerning divisions in the church and other other issues that were not being addressed properly. We'll read at the end of 1 Corinthians that there was this delegation and apparently uh, these folks who came to him, uh, Paul sent the letter, this letter back with them. He was planning uh, to leave Ephesus around 56 AD and that's when he wrote this letter. So if you want to position it historically in terms of chronology, 56 AD. I know that you've encountered this as I have through the years. I remember uh, very well uh, years and years ago 
uh, ministering and someone said to me, they said, you know, I just, I just want to be part of a New Testament church. So I asked them what they meant by that, and they had this sort of a Pollyannish uh, idea about it. So I said, well, which one of the New Testament churches in the New Testament would you like to be a part of? Corinth, where they fought over who was their favorite preacher, uh, where there was immorality and they sort of overlooked it because they thought their freedom in Christ allowed for something like that, where they took one another to court, where they disputed over uh, what food you could eat, where they disputed over the spiritual gifts, where they made a mockery of the Lord's Supper, where some members of the congregation denied the resurrection. You want to be a part of that New Testament church? The one in Colossae, which was coming under assault of some uh, people who were denying basic truths about the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, the church at Thessalonica, that, where they were so caught up in the second coming of Jesus that some began to advocate that you stop work and liquidate everything and just wait for Jesus. Prompting Paul to say, if you don't work, you don't eat. Churches in Galatia, in the province of Galatia, that cluster of churches there where, where someone had come in and added to the gospel. You see the point. All churches of the Lord Jesus Christ are imperfect because they're made up of sinners. In fact, a Elderly preacher told me years and years ago, before, before the Lord even made it plain that he was directing me toward ministry, serving in, in pastoral ministry, he said, son, if you ever find the perfect church, don't join it, because you will mess it up. Churches are imperfect, because we're made up of sinners, saved by grace, who still battle with remaining sin. But the good news is that we have a perfect gospel. The gospel is perfect. And what you're going to see as we go through this letter is that Paul, just straight on, head on, addresses these problems that have been brought to him by members of the house of Chloe and that answers questions that have been asked in a letter he's received. But you're going to see that he does so with the gospel. You see, this perfect gospel is about a perfect God, the true and living God, the only God, who in love and mercy showed grace to sinners by sending his perfect son. How do we know his son was perfect? Because he perfectly kept the whole law, never sinning. He perfectly stood in our place representing us, becoming the sinner in our place, even though himself was not sinful. Enduring God's wrath for sin, dying, rising. Paul is going to make much of the resurrection and go so far in 1 Corinthians 15 to say, if Christ is not risen, then what you and I call faith is vain. Rising from the grave ascending on high, coming again. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Corinthians is going to address that. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. It's the message that's designed to transform the lives of believers, make us different, both individually and as a corporate body. But here's the tragedy. The Corinthians... We're destroying their witness through disunity, through party strife. You see, the, the scripture makes it very plain. Paul writes in other places to, to strive to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And the word strive, when he uses it, is the word agonizomai, to, to agonize, to spend energy. You see, unity in the body of a local body of believers doesn't happen 
uh, just by osmosis. It doesn't happen because we simply give a mental assent that it would be nice to have unity. It happens as we agonize, as we, as we put to death remaining sin in our own body, as we help others who, who may have an outcropping that is a tendency toward disunity, to help them to, to reign under those things. And the disunity in Corinth that we're going to see as we study through this was, was damaging their witness. The immorality was making a mockery of the pure gospel. And on and on. And Paul's going to bring the gospel to bear. If you were looking for a word that would capture the tone of 1 Corinthians, it would be the word correction. I want to just show you a couple of verses of Scripture to kind of flesh this out. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 19 and 20 with me, if you would. Where Paul is exhorting them on this subject, this, this issue of immorality. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And then 1 Corinthians 10, verses 12 to 13, as he's, as he's addressing again in a different way how you deal with temptation. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. It's taken out of the Old Testament. And the picture there is that anyone who thinks he stands erect, that I stand straight and tall. Paul says, be careful. You know, it's interesting when you, when you do, uh, when you counsel premaritally uh, getting ready for a wedding, and then when you get up to the wedding time, I, I always tell the groom uh, and the groomsman, and I'll typically tell everyone at the, at the uh, rehearsal time, but particularly take the groom and the groomsman aside and say, when you stand up, when you're standing there and you're going to be standing for a while, do not lock your knees. Straight up. You know why you don't lock your knees? Because you cut circulation off to your legs. There's been more than one occasion in 40 years of doing weddings when you look and you see someone and they start to sway. And you hope somebody will catch them before they fall. It's a picture here. That he who thinks he stands erect, straight and tall, take heed lest he fall. What's he talking about there? We need to walk humbly before our God. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Well, that kind of, that, that sort of slays the notion of humming, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, right? No temptation. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation... He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Some key verses in this letter. Of course, the key chapter you would, you would almost unanimously say together is 1 Corinthians 13. In the middle of helping them as they are abusing the spiritual gifts and using them to one-up each other, Paul says, I want to show you the more excellent way. And, and, and you will hardly, you'll be hard pressed to go to a wedding and not hear 1 Corinthians 13 read, but it is the best definition of love ever penned. But it was not written primarily to be read to a, to a blushing bride and a, and a bright eyed groom about to be married. It was written to a church was being torn asunder by by pride surrounding the abuse of the spiritual gifts. You see, Paul will tell us in 1 Corinthians 13 that love is not an idea primarily. But love is a commitment. And it calls for action. And so it shouldn't surprise us when we think about John 3.16 that God so loved that he gave. There was movement. And we're going to see that when we look at 1 Corinthians. 
you're going to see how Paul wants them to recognize Jesus Christ in the middle of their life together. As he tells them that Christ became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He opens that up in the first chapter, verse 30. You see, this letter helps us today because it's very practical. If, if Romans is primarily doctrinal, where you hit the great doctrines of the faith, Corinthians, by the way, is the second longest letter Paul writes. Romans is the longest. Corinthians is very practical. It focuses on some basic social and moral and spiritual issues. It's very plain. If Romans is lofty, 1 Corinthians is plain. It's unvarnished, one fellow said. Very direct. In terms of Greek syntax, the sentences are very simple. And even though it's primarily practical, several doctrinal issues are addressed. The church, as an organism, as a body, the place of spiritual gifts in the life of the body, and of course, the resurrection. The length of 1 Corinthians is intriguing. No other what you would call practical letter. When you say practical, you're not implying that the other letters are impractical. But no other practical letter has this length. And it speaks to two things, it seems to me. One is that the uh, many-faceted problems that were part and parcel of the life of the church at Corinth. And the second is the love of God for that church to inspire his apostle to go to the lengths he did to speak to the matters. It was not an easy letter for him to write. In fact, if you're familiar with the body of material we know as 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, when he gives this strong admonition, exhortation, in fact, it's a, it's a command about how to deal with immorality that's manifested itself. He will write in the second letter, I know my other letter hurt you. And I didn't mean for it to hurt you, but it had to hurt you to get your attention. And now you've taken action. And now the man has repented. And now receive him back so he doesn't fall into further temptation. Paul writes this with pain. He spent 18 months here. You kind of break the, the letter up in this, uh, if you just, as you're reading through it. And I would encourage you to read through it in, in a sitting from time to time as we go through this study. When you see this phrase, now concerning, or now, when you, when you spot that, he is, he is moving to another uh, topic. And I'm just going to give you just a snapshot today, you can, you can really see three divisions in 1 Corinthians. First is this, this answer to Chloe's report, or the report of someone from Chloe's household of the divisions, chapters 1 to 4. Then an answer to the report of fornication that's taking place in the church, chapters 5 and 6. And then an answer to a letter of questions, chapters 7 to 16. And we'll be looking uh, through those lenses. I want us to take the verses we read, and just real briefly today, look at those and see how Paul introduces this letter. And when you look at these three verses, I, we just see these things. We see Paul's calling as an apostle, Paul's letter to the church of God that is in Corinth, and then Paul's greeting to and desire for the Corinthians. First, his calling as an apostle. 
Notice how, you, and by the way, I've told you this before, if you're familiar with the, with the letters, the epistles, they're called in the, in the New Testament. Uh, you and I write a letter, and we, dear so-and-so, and, we think, and, then, and then we get to the end of it, signed sincerely, and we put our name. They did it differently in the first century. They signed their name at the top, so you know who it was from. And so this is from Paul. And he always identifies himself. An apostle. He's called by the will of God. And the word there called is summoned. He received a divine summons. And you know about that story. He was on the road to Damascus. He had a whole different agenda for his life. He was a Jew of Jews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, schooled by Gamaliel, climbing up the ladder of Judaism, headed toward the very top as he went about exterminating the followers of the way. And the risen Jesus Christ arrested him on the Damascus road and summoned him to the service of an apostle. Saved him and summoned him. So called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, the Messiah whose name is Jesus. And our brother Sosthenes, I don't know if you caught it when we were reading through uh, Acts 18, 1 to 17. I'll read verse 17 to you again. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. So he had a brother who had marks, he had the, the uh, stigmata in his body. Paul would say, I bear in my body the, the stigmata of the Lord Jesus. In other words, I've been marked, physically marked by persecution because of my identification with Jesus. Well, so had Sosthenes, who, who had not been a believer very long and faced uh, beatings for his faith in Christ. And so, so Paul writes this letter. He, he greets the church at Corinth. And wants them to know, and Sosthenes, who's my, who's my partner here uh, in Ephesus, also sends his greetings. We're together. The two of us pray for you. And we want you to know that. So he, he has identified that the letter he's about to send is authoritative because he is an apostle. By the way, I would remind you, when you look at the Greek word apostle, you see the word apostolos. What does that tell you? It tells you that they did not translate it. It's transliterated. When you read apostle, it's, you say, well, I wish I could read the Greek of that. You are. It's, it's apostolos. But it means sent one. In fact, the Latin equivalent of apostolos is missio. You know what you hear there. Missionary. Missionary. Sent one. Because missio means sent as well. Paul, I'm one sent. I have the title an apostle. He will say in 1 Corinthians 15 that, that Jesus appeared to the twelve as he's arguing for the resurrection. And then he says to me as one born out of due season. He's an apostle. He writes with authority. He writes under the authority of Christ Jesus. In other words, the Corinthians don't have the right to ignore what he's saying. Now, if you read the Corinthian material, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, you'll know, you'll discover more in 2 Corinthians that there's this group that Paul mockingly calls the super apostles because they've come into Corinth after he's been there and have stirred up mischief and have spoken ill of him. He's going to have to defend uh, his, his name. I was reading about a man who slandered another man, defamed him, said awful things about him, and the man took the slanderer to court, and the, and the fellow that was on the receiving end of, the, of being accused of being slanderous said, well, I didn't, didn't mean anything by it. And so the judge said, before I pronounce my sentence, I want you to write down all the things that you said, and we're going to look at it. I want this fellow who, who you said them about, he'll help you remember them, write them all down. And I want you on the way home, I want you to tear them up into shreds of paper and throw them out the window and come back tomorrow. 
So the man did as he was told by the judge. He came back the next day, and the judge said, Now, before I pronounce my sentence, I want you to hand me all the pieces, the complete pieces of the paper that you wrote these things down on. And the man said, Well, that's, that's impossible. I don't know where they've gone. And the judge said, Exactly. Once it comes out of your mouth, you have no control where it goes. And Paul was being slandered by this group, this Judaizers, the, the super apostles he calls them. And he has to defend his ministry. And so he's writing with authority, apostolic authority, arguing for his calling as an apostle. Second thing I want you to see is that this letter is addressed in all the things I've told you now. They, they're going to fuss over, over who they favor as a preacher. Some like Paul, some like Apollos, some like Peter. And then some people said, well, you, you fellows, you men chasers, we, we just, we're better than all of you. We just follow Jesus. So they were even prideful in talking about following Jesus. Divisions, scandal, we've already gone through the list, all these things. You would read through that and think, okay, at some point, at some point, don't you forfeit the right to be called a church of God, a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are certain, if you, if you abandon the gospel, if that becomes the tenor and the direction of the church under its leadership, then yeah, that can happen. But the encouraging thing to me is that all that is wrong with Corinth, Paul still says, to the church of God that is in Corinth. To those, now watch, he's going to narrow the circle. To those sanctified, that is who are being sanctified in Christ Jesus. You see, remember now that when we're saved, we're justified. We are, we are declared not guilty and accepted as righteous. We're delivered in justification from the penalty of sin but justification never stands alone it always it has a twin called sanctification and if you've really been justified by faith if you've been saved by grace through faith then you are being sanctified if justification is I have been delivered from the penalty of sin sanctification says I am being delivered by the power of sin as we make our way to glory so that when when Jesus comes and we're glorified, we can say, I have now been finally delivered, not only from the, from the power of sin, but from the very presence of sin. But while we're here on this earth in the journey, we're being delivered by the power of sin. That's one of the marks of sanctification. So he's, he is zeroing in a little more to those in Corinth, in this church of God, who are being sanctified in Christ Jesus. Because you see, it only happens in the gospel. Called to be saints. Just as he was called, summoned to be an apostle, we are summoned as saints. Talked with someone recently who referenced a decision he made as, as a boy in a church and yet living a scandalous life. And we pointed out to him how scandalous it was. Lovingly said, you're going to hell. Ah, I'm sorry you feel that way. Well, it's not about my feelings. Summoned saints. I had a 90-year-old woman say to me one time, well, I never claimed to be holy. I said, oh, dear. If you've been saved by grace through faith, God has made that claim upon you. It's not something you can cast off. Saints means set apart. Set apart from sin as a dominating factor in your life. Yes, a remaining, you battle with it, you better believe it. Set apart from sin, set apart unto service to God. That's what a saint is. Called to be saints. And not primarily individually, not on an island, not a long ranger. Look, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's he doing there? He's already laying the foundation to, to shatter 
the divisive attitude that manifests itself in Corinth. If you name Jesus Christ in a real saving way, and I name Jesus Christ in a real saving way, there should be more that we have in common than anything we might have differently that binds us together. He says both, he's both their Lord and our Lord. Summoned as saints. And then finally, his greeting. It's a greeting to them and a desire for them. Look, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Paul opens his, many of his letters like this. If you just want to do a search, if you have an electronic Bible, digital Bible, and do a search, grace to you and peace, it'll pop up in several of his letters as they open up. But it's not just a a greeting, clever greeting he uses. He is saying something here. You see, God's grace, he, I, he says, I want the grace of God that you claim to have in your lives, I want it to be manifest in your lives and in your life together as a church. Grace to you. And if, if you have grace, guess what? If God has shown you his undeserved love, if he, has, if he has loved you unconditionally in and through Jesus Christ so that the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ has, has made a difference in your life, he is your Lord and you belong to him, if you have God's grace, then guess what the fruit of God's grace is? It is peace. Peace with God. Paul writes to the Ephesians, after he says we're saved by grace through faith, not that not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, so that none of us can boast. And then he goes on and says, for he himself, Jesus, he himself is our peace. He has brought us to have peace with God. I told you last week, if we lived in the New Testament era and we encountered one another when it was Sometimes appropriate for Christians to be somewhat clandestine, they would do some things. One of the things they would do is what, they'd be talking, and they would just draw sort of a half-moon line. And if the other fellow drew the other half of the moon and connected it into a fish, then they knew they were speaking to a believer. And the fish in the Greek was ichthus. And you simply take the letters of that, Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. And they would say to one another, Irene! which is peace. And the response was irene. And the, and the message was, all is well between us. There's no impediment to our relationship. Grace to you and peace. They didn't have peace in the Corinthian church. When we read through this, you're going to sometimes go, wow, in the world. And yet, look at the church in the West today. Look at local churches. Look at us <laughs> Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. No, what's, what's the point of that? God executed his wrath upon Jesus. But God the Father and Jesus were not at odds with one another. The Father and the Son worked in complete harmony. If you looked at that from a distance, you would say, wow. Wow. Jesus must have really messed up. When I was working with some neighborhood children when we were in uh, Shreveport, Mary started a club with the neighborhood children. I remember one time we were approaching Easter, and I said, I asked them, why did Jesus die? One of the little boys whose dad was in jail said, because he was bad, broke the law. I said, oh, no. And tried to help him understand. You see, at a distance, when you hear that God crushed Jesus, then you figure something must have been really bad in that relationship. No, no, no. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Two of the blessed persons of the Trinity who work in harmony. God set his heart upon a people to save them in eternity past. Jesus came in the fullness of time and, and lived perfectly and died in the place of those people. Paul is already arguing by his, by his introduction, by his challenge to them, and by his speaking a word of blessing, and, and which is at once in the same time a desire for them, that he wants the divisions to stop. For the sake of Jesus, they must stop. 
That's how he opens this letter to the church at Corinth in southern Greece. Powerful metropolitan area. Great commerce. Great opportunity. Oh, great immorality in that city. Well, I would suggest to you that you can look around and there's some places that hadn't really changed much, have they? But here's the good news. The gospel is still the power of God to those who are being saved. I hope you noticed what we were reading through Acts 18 when he said, I'm going to the Gentiles from here on out. It was, it was after that that two different leaders of the synagogue were, were converted. And one of them is joining him in Ephesus as he writes this letter to Corinth. I pray that you'll, you'll take this in, that we'll, God will help us to read it and study it and embrace the gospel and all that is important in that and, and, and recognize that, that we need to agonize to be together. You see, Adam's, Adam's vine grows the attitude of separating and criticizing. That's in the first Adam. Anybody can do that. You don't have to be saved to do that. But in the second Adam, in Jesus, it is, it's the promoting of unity, the blessing, the edifying, the encouraging, the building up. That's what the gospel produces. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come and we look at this letter and we pray to God, I don't, I don't want to be one of those that Paul had in his sights when he, was, when he had to scold them for, for not acting like spiritual people, but acting like carnal people. Like, but the best he could say about some of the folks in Corinth was that they were acting like newborn babes in Christ. And he was saying this to people who'd been saved a while. Oh, God, help us to take this letter and help. Use your spirit to take this truth and just, as, as was prayed, wash over us with your word and cleanse us anew and afresh for your glory, for the name of Jesus upon our lives and this church, for the advance of the gospel from this place, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.